we are live. So, hey, oh. everybody. This is Gweek episode 85, and it's the first one that we are doing using Google Hangouts. We've been experiencing some problems with Skype. So this, uh, this Google Plus Hangout is an experiment that has some interesting advantages. One is that we can do it live. Two, we have video. And three, hopefully we won't have the kind of dropouts that uh, we've been experiencing on past episodes. So uh, this is Gweek episode 85. I'm Mark Fraunfelder. And Geek is where the editors and friends of Boing Boing talk about comic books, science fiction and fantasy, video games, board games, TV shows, music, movies, tools, gadgets, apps, and other neat stuff. And I have two guests today. My first guest is Peter Biebergall, and uh, actually pronounced Biebergall. Gall, is that right? Gall, you got Gall. it. Gall. Peter Biebergall. <laughs> sure. Peter is the author of a terrific book called Too Much to Dream, A Psychedelic American Boyhood, and it's out now from Soft Skull Press, and he also writes for various online and print magazines, and he blogs at mysterytheater.blogspot.com. And my other guest is Glenn Fleischman. Glenn's a regular, and Glenn is the executive editor of The Magazine, a periodical for technology-minded readers that isn't always about technology. He's also the host of the podcast, The New Disruptors, and one of the writers of The Economist magazine's Babbage blog. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Very good. Great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, that's right. This is your second time, Peter. That's right. That, that's good. Uh, and I, we have a lot of things to talk about with you and, and Glenn. Um, oh. Things are really happening in your circle. You've got like two big media <laughs> uh, things that have happened like in the last few uh, few weeks or months. Uh, you're you're the executive editor, like we said, for the magazine, which is this kind of new experiment in in publishing, and uh, and the news disruptors, which is a fantastic uh, podcast that I've been listening to with really great interviews. I, I listened uh, recently to the one that you did with with Tonks, the the coffee. Oh maven. yeah, that was fun. And and just in the inception moment, you're on the latest one. You're on oh. number five. So when Yay. That, whenever this airs. <laughs> People watching live know, but you'll be on there. That came out beautifully. Thank you for being on. Thank you for being on that podcast. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's great. So, uh, Glenn, maybe talk a little bit about the magazine and and the model behind it, and and uh, kind of how how it got started and how you got involved. And also, my other question is, your microphone is like flipped up like that. That okay. is that intentional? Yeah. Can you? I'm using a different. I'm using oh, my yeah. stereo. So yeah. I know it looks ridiculous. Sounds fine. Here, you know I'm actually going to put it down here because I think it's distracting. <laughs> People wonder <laughs> what's going on. But I'm talking through. I'm talking through this device down here. There we go. Excellent. Uh, I love those Yeti it's, mics. It's, I have so, one it's so rich and full. So uh, well. So the magazine is interesting. So Marco Arment, who's the fellow behind uh, Instapaper, that like read later service. Uh, who was also one of the people, early people in Tumblr, and helped build Tumblr to a pretty huge size before he went off on his own. Um, it, you know, he he's been running Instapaper for years, and Instapaper is the thing you use when you have an article that's too long to read where you're at, or you want to transfer it, you know, to a mobile device you're reading on the desktop, and you want to switch, or vice versa. And he's always been interested in this long form thing, and he sees how many people are reading material that we've been told people aren't going to read anymore because it's too involved, it's too long form. And uh, so he came up with this notion. He's already an iOS programmer, so he can sit down and write a great app. He's already got a huge audience he can talk to and say, here's a project I'm working on. He launched this thing kind of just blind and said, I want to do an iOS publication, not just iOS, but iOS 6 only, because it's easier going forward, right? One version of that platform. And he's selling it only through the Apple uh iOS newsstand. So all of these constraints. It's like, you know, iOS 6, dun, 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 dun. And you want to run, you know, a few interesting articles for people who have a technology interest. But just like um, my, I was talking to my dad about this, who's a big sports fan, and he um, loves to cite Grantland from ESPN because Grantland talks about sports in a way that most other sites, well, at least used to not. And when it talks about things that aren't sports, it's still in a way that people who are really sports enthusiasts can get into. And so that's kind of what we're doing with uh, the magazine. So he was a few issues in. I pitched to him uh, coming on as editor because I knew he'd need help. And then I've been sucked in and, and spending a good part of my time now finding authors, editing, um, you know, tweaking, and, and doing all the usual editorial stuff. And uh, the the thing about it, uh, this is kind of the second publication of this sort of ilk I've been involved with. Is you know, as opposed to I think the first wave 
maybe the first few waves of internet publications had to be driven by advertising. Now we're at a point where subscriptions are starting to come back. Like there was that paywall thing and the resistance to paywall, and then advertising revenue has dropped for a lot of people. And now you've come back to this place where Apple takes 30%, but they make it really easy to do subscriptions. So we have a substantial number of subscribers. Mark is not giving out numbers or dollars yet, but it's it's enough to pay for me to you know more than break even to pay writers a very good. We're paying close to magazine rates for writers. We're hiring illustrators, and we hope to ramp up from there. That is terrific. Um, I mean, this this really presents an opportunity for journalists to 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 get back doing what they love after this. Uh, we've been in this interesting transition period for such a long time where access to media has never been greater and opportunities to create new kinds of media have never been better, but ways for the content creators to get paid have never been worse. Yeah, that's what it feels like is that there's this loss of idea that people who write and do other stuff are worthwhile. The people who produce and you know collect the value uh, remember when About.com got sold to the New York Times company? And I, I, if I remember right, I don't think the hosts at About.com, the moderators of all those thousands of sections, got much or anything, but it was a multi-hundred million dollar deal. And I thought, what is that? You know, it's really a website with a database. It's nothing sophisticated like even some of the newer editorial sites that do more data-driven things. You know, where did that go? So, yeah, I love the idea. I'm so excited to have money to pay authors. I mean, I know that was a great day at Boing Boing when you guys started to be able to consistently assign out paying work for people. You reach the point where you've got all these freelancers coming in and working for you. It's it's such a lovely thing to say your work is valuable and the scale of operations, the way in which we get visitors, the way people are interested in it has now finally gotten to a point where we can say we can pay what's almost a living wage. Like, if you could work at this rate, which you can't for us 40 hours a week, but if you could, you could make a living. So if you can piece together enough work, maybe you can make a living being a freelance writer more routinely. Yeah, that's that would be fantastic. Peter, you have done a lot, just like all of us, uh, freelance writing and stuff. H have you seen any new opportunities for, for your writing appear recently, or is something like the magazine the first kind of new fresh thing you've seen for, for freelance journalists. It is pretty new that I've seen. I mean, part of it, the problem is is that it's bec it, it used to feel like in the early days, I remember it must have been like 96, I think I got my, 97, I got my first piece published with Salon Magazine. And I think they paid $300. And I couldn't believe it. And, and I felt like I was immediately able to have these instant relationships with editors very fast. And it seems over time, maybe it's just because there's so many people that now are writing online and that there's more opportunities, it seems that the relationship to the editors has closed a little bit. Like, you don't feel like you have that direct connection. And if you do, um, sometimes you the, you don't hear back sort of in the same way that you used to hear back sort of more immediately. So it seems that the more there is, it's almost like there's – there's more outlets, there's more people, but there seems like there's less opportunity for that, um, that that a lot of sites sort of have their stable of writers that they've found, and that's sort of the end of it, and you're, you can feel sort of, you have to feel lucky again to make that connection, it seems. Yeah, I, I remember in the, uh, in, in like the, the late 90s, when the industry standard was the record holder for the most ad pages sold in a year. Oh, yeah. They were so starved for content. I mean, yep. they, were, they were cranking out like 400 page issues every week and having spin-off magazines because they still yes. couldn't, they, they st still needed, uh, you know, they still had so many ads rolling in. Oh, I think it's worth explaining that point too, which is that if you want to get second class mailing privileges, uh, you have to have a certain content to ad ratio and they couldn't, they had to keep paying more and more for content. Business 2.0 was paying me two and a half dollars a word under mm -hmm. contract in 2001 because they had like, you know, 700 pages of ads and they were coming out every two weeks and they had to fill, I think, like 250 pages of content or they would lose their postal privileges to send at the cheap rate. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, I, uh, I had the same experience with the industry standard. They were having me write anything that I threw at them, like like recipes and uh, a, a profile of uh, 
of a Dean Kamen's father, Jack Kamen, who was a <laughs> DC comic book artist. Oh, oh it was yeah. really, yeah. it was really great. Um, so the uh, the other thing, uh, Glenn, that you uh, have been uh, working on is this new terrific podcast called The New Disruptors, which is uh, the, the title itself kind of explains what it's about. And I think in, in one of the episodes, didn't you interview the the, the uh, fellow behind the atavist? Yeah, that's right. That was uh, number four just a few weeks ago is uh, Evan yeah. Ratliff. And yeah, it's the, I, I went to this conference. Oh, you and I talked on a different podcast. You and I talked about this. The XOXO conference in the middle of September in Portland, which is one of the best events I've ever been to. And they brought together all the people who make stuff, all the different kinds of people, and all the people who figure out how to get that stuff in some technological means out to an audience, and had you know a day of makers and a day of sort of intermediaries, but like this new sort that doesn't act as a gatekeeper, doesn't get in the way of getting stuff out. And I came away from that thinking there is I knew I knew about Kickstarter and Etsy and a few others, but I got exposed to a hundred things and thought this is a story that people who are trying to do creative work and want to not be intermediated by, you know, and people who are stopping them from doing that or taking 10, 20, I mean, I mentioned Apple, you know, Apple takes 30% from the newsstand or for any app that you sell in there, and they don't deliver 30% worth. They deliver a, a fairly decent amount in part of its marketing, but you look instead at someone like Square for in-person transactions where they're taking a, a few percentage points and they're everything to do is to try to make it easier for you to do in-person transactions or Etsy where it takes a three and a half percent of sales it doesn't take 20 percent they're not trying to nickel and dime you it's flat rates so the whole point of the podcast is to help people be exposed to all of these new ways they can reach an audience and make it you know I don't know I think better for creative types whatever you're doing if it's technical or purely artistic, whatever figure out how to how to connect directly and make a living at it. I mean, there's always, I'm a craftsperson, I think, as a writer, I was trained as a graphic designer, it's always, there's a craft involved, and the craft is art plus commerce, and I need to have the commerce part to practice the kind of art I do, and I need to make a living from it. Yeah, um, tell me a little, so uh, I thought the interview with the, uh, with uh, the Atavis guy, I'm sorry, I forget his name. Oh, I, yeah, I, Evan, Evan Ratliff, really yeah, nice I know. guy. I have, uh, and I have spoken to Evan before too. Um, but uh, tell me a little bit about the difference between the Atavist's model and the magazine's model. Yeah, it's kind of we're we're very complementary, which is kind of neat to have an uh, ecosystem that already supports what they're doing, which is long form fiction and not a ton of it, and what we're doing, which is you know short form, medium length features, twelve hundred to two thousand words. What they want to do is take something that might appear in the New Yorker, and instead of it appearing just in the New Yorker at you know ten thousand or fifteen thousand words, they want to allow an author to write it once to get a modest upfront fee, but not it's not ex it's not excessive. You get a lot more from a magazine, but then on the back end, the author keeps a lot more of that back end than you ever would. And there is a back end. You you publish, and then they sell it on the web. They sell it in their app. They're now selling subscriptions in the app, so you can subscribe to the monthly. The, their work that comes out uh, once a month. Uh, you, they release it as Amazon Kindle singles, which sell in huge numbers. Uh, David Dobbs' uh, book about uh, my mother's lover, about this whole fascinating thing about how he found out in his mother's deathbed that um, his mother had a lover in World War II who was killed, and it became this, it's a beautiful story, and it sold, I forget, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies on Amazon, and now it can go to Nook, and it can go to every e-publishing platform. So the Atavist at one level is a monthly long-form magazine that puts out one long-form thing and then distributes it everywhere, and then they've turned that into a platform, so they're selling their system for doing that, their content management and publishing system, to other publications, too. Now, at the magazine, we don't have any plans to become a platform, but we're kind of on the short end of that. Like, we're subscription-based entirely, and subscriptions drive enough money, we get enough people paying a very small amount of money to drive it out, and maybe we'll eventually turn some of this into collections and anthologies. Uh, when we have enough features of the right kind. And at uh, the other end, the Atavist is saying, let's take one really incredibly researched longitudinal piece per month and push that out and then leverage that to everything. Has, has Evan given any numbers, like how many uh, uh, articles are sold? I don't think they put out anything for, in general, it's, from what I've read that he said, it's, you know, they're clearly in the range of tens of thousands for each piece. It's not, um, I don't think they're at a level of hundreds of thousands. They've definitely had, like David Dobbs' uh, article or a uh, feature, 
uh, was a big seller. It got a lot of attention. It was one of the early ones, but they've had, a, it sounds like, two or three that have really spiked. And, and you know what sparked Evan? This is what we talked about on um, the podcast with him is he did that piece called Vanish for Wired that got enormous amount of attention, won tons of awards about trying to disappear himself after writing about people um, disappearing and how mm -hmm. people find them. Fascinating piece and it involved people tracking him online and there was a contest and he was trying to hide then he went through some real psychological deprivation that he didn't expect during it, like just trying to pretend to hide effectively and he realized with that feature how much, not money was left on the table but opportunity that Wired could publish it in one form but not everywhere and not make it sustainable and he made plenty of money from it but think about it as an author that you, there's this issue, I, I've had this conversation with some uh, editors I've worked with for years and one of them was like you know, you're going to get to first base a lot of the time. You can get to first base consistently with a book or whatever you're doing. You can make some money. You can make a living. But you have to hit them out of the park sometimes. And those average out. And in the publishing world right now, they focus on blockbusters. They don't focus on getting to first base. They keep throwing stuff out there, and they want giant sellers. So all of what we're doing now is saying, you know, you can get to first, second, third, and there's going to be some opportunity for you to, to get on the back end from that. We're going to support you, you know, coming home, but we don't have to make you a blockbuster every time. We have a model that will allow you to get paid well, even if you don't hit it out of the park. That's great. I, I, I'm finally feeling like there is something out there that's going to give uh, uh, reporters and journalists and writers another opportunity to make a living doing this kind of thing. It feels like yeah. something's really happening. And this is just the start. I think the thing is, it's that ability to collect really tiny amounts of money and aggregate them, and it's always been so hard. Micropayments, whether it was a penny or two dollars, have been difficult, and something has changed in, it's not just the way the credit card processors handle it. People are willing to pay 99 cents for things or subscribe to the magazine for two bucks a month or pay the Atavist two or three dollars for a Kindle single like all of that model is percolated and now you have millions of people willing to pay you know ten cents to three dollars and that adds up to hundreds of millions of dollars a year today and it'll be billions very easily when you get a hundred million people regularly paying a dollar to a few dollars for stuff mark you saw you know uh, uh, Andrew Sullivan just went is leaving the Daily Beast mm -hmm. to start right. a twenty dollar a year freemium site. You can read some pages on his new site for free. When you get to a certain point, they're going to ask you to pay. They pulled in $400,000 in the first weekend, the first like four days that they launched a pledge towards a goal of about 900 to make it sufficient over a year. And and that would be unheard of two years ago. People have tried it before. They typically haven't succeeded for a single site. And I think the crossovers happen. There's not enough that's interesting happening in traditional media or even traditional online media and the readers are trying new models now, new models of paying. Yeah, I think, and I also think that uh, uh, his, his uh, model is really smart, saying that no incoming link to his site will ever immediately hit a paywall. That, so great. Yeah, it, it's really smart. And, you know, that, that leaves an opportunity open for someone to game it, but I think uh, there sounds like there's going to be enough goodwill that he'll be able to keep this going. That's the thing, too, is if you make things open for people, they don't game it. Some percentage of people will. The Take Control book series I've written for for uh, I don't know, eight or nine years now, this is Adam and Tanya Enks of uh, Tidbits, the Mac publication, we've never put DRM on our PDFs, never have. They don't get stolen. People don't rip them off <laughs> because they could, so they, they're like, oh, these people aren't trying to do something funny, so they'll hand them off to people and suggest they go and buy a copy, and then people often do. They say, oh, my friend gave me a copy of this book. I liked it, so I came and bought a copy. We don't treat them like thieves, and I don't think Andrew Sullivan's going to treat people like link thieves either. Yeah, really smart. So, so very cool. So, uh, the magazine is an, is, a, is an iOS app you can check out, and the new Disruptors is part of the Mule Network. I'll have links to, to that podcast uh, on this site. So, both great stuff, Glenn. Congratulations, and, and keep up the good work disrupting so media. Thank you. <laughs> so, so Peter, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what you're up to. Um, you you had an interesting uh, thing that you wanted to talk about: the lack of pop culture for that once powerful consumer, the ten to thirteen year old boy. Uh, and yeah. this is kind of a, a lot of what you were writing about in uh, in uh, your uh, "Too Much to Dream: A Psychedelic American Boyhood." You're, you're kind of that's right. The huge influence that kind of geek culture had on you. So, so what's what's the deal today? Well, I you know I have an eleven year old, 
and I realized that I spend an inordinate amount of time with him on Common Sense Media, which I think is a terrific site. Sometimes they're a little bit conservative on, I think, the wrong side, or at least they're overly conservative. But for the most part, I think it's an excellent website for parents to find good age-appropriate content. And the problem we've been having is I, find, I it made me recall when I'm going to be 46 in a couple of weeks, and that generation of kids, it seems, it was growing up in the 70s as in 80s, when we were 10, 11, and 12, it just seemed like there was so much amazing content for us, that everything um, was directed towards, I mean, you know, if you think of everything from Micronauts to Star Wars to the Avengers comic books to, it, it just was a golden age of content. And as I sort of have this son now that I want to do all these very cool things with, I remember being really excited about video games when I was a kid and wanting them to always get better and better. And now the best video games are so abhorrently violent that it's hard to find good things for him to want to, to play and for that I want to play with him. The Lego video games, for example, are terrific, but you can only play so many Lego video games before <laughs> it just becomes sort of redundant. And so we've, you know, we've, he and I have sort of worked really hard to find good, appropriate content, and it doesn't always seem easy. And then when something exciting is going to come out, for example, I saw a trailer for that game Borderlands 2. And the first trailer I saw looked like, oh, this is finally going to be a fun, cartoony shooter for kids who, you know, want to get their guns out and sort of blast things around, but it's going to not be, it's going to be right. And then when I started to actually see gameplay videos, it's so unbelievably violent. And you wonder why the creators feel that they would have to take a game like this and make it that sort of explicit. And I think part of it is, is, the content makers were those 10, 11, and 12-year-old kids in the 70s and 80s. And I think what they're doing is they're making the games and the content that they themselves want to play now <laughs> rather than thinking about the current generation of you know 11-year-old boys that are looking for fun but um, appropriate content. And, you know, I'm definitely not a prude. You know, I mean, I Sam was watching, you know, Indiana Jones when he was five. You know, I, I totally get that um, boys like guns and that boys want to be able to have access to certain kinds of content. Um, but it seems that I just have to work so hard to find things that feel like they are um, appropriate to my values um, and also – to an 11 year old that you want to you know you want to give him a little bit of a leash you want him to experience things and not feel like everything is censored and to let him have an experience um, with his own exploration um, Sam has his own laptop now and he spends a lot of time on YouTube and I think there's a lot of great content on YouTube but you look at the comments on any given YouTube video and I I don't want him <laughs> You know, watching YouTube videos, not because the videos content is bad, but the comments on YouTube are so you know really atrocious. So, um, so I was having a conversation with Sam last night, and we were talking about. I asked him to sort of give me his list of what he thinks are the great things for his age group that aren't you know sort of overly uh, violent, but not sort of either dumbed down. Um, he loves Nerf, Nerf guns, and I have to admit, it's a pretty great toy. They're really well made. They're incredibly uh, modular, and he's gotten me pretty excited about running around the house, you know, shooting Nerf guns. So that's one thing that I find is a good way of sort of getting that sort of gun-toting fantasy out in a way that's sort of safe and also just um, with a product that I think is pretty pretty well made and and that the company seems to be really excited too about their product and always coming out with sort of really new and cool things. Minecraft of course is the essential, you know, kids video game right now. The only thing there is I think it it the compulsion aspect is intense there. 
Just um, because it's so addictive? It's very addictive, you know. Mm -hmm. And Sam plays um, on these servers, and he's gotten to meet, you know, kids from all over the world um, that he chats with and, and has online interactions with that, of course, you know, we monitor. But um, but there's an, an intensity often for, I think, a lot of kids around Minecraft, um, especially now that a lot of the um, play is driven towards gaming but using Minecraft as the uh, toolbox so there's sort oh. of like killing zombies but it's in Minecraft and and these um, developers have created these incredible mods to be able to you know build out something like playing Call of Duty versus zombies within a, the context of a Minecraft toolbox you're essentially doing the same things, but it's Minecraft, so it doesn't, <laughs> you know, feel that bad. <laughs> so See, I'm gonna really have to, that. I'm gonna find you in a few years. I have a five-year-old boy and an eight-year-old boy, and I'm as you describe these things, I'm like, okay, I got. I'm gonna. I know somebody now. I can ask these questions about video games, violent video games, access. <laughs> that's appropriate. <laughs> Although I can only imagine in four years what they're gonna be. So neural interfaces. Uh, true. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We've pushed the envelope a little bit with Halo, which is just about shooting aliens. Um, but if playing multiplayer on that with just shooting aliens is, you know, it goes to that thing where I remember when Sam was growing up and I was, you know, always asking myself when I would buy him a new toy, I would buy him a Star Wars laser gun, but I would never buy him a realistic military gun. And I had to ask myself, why are laser guns okay, but guns that shoot bullets are not okay? Obviously, one has a fantasy element to it, but it's partly because I like laser guns. You know, so, <laughs> you know, so sort of giving over to that a little bit. Um, other video games would be any of the um, electronic arts sports game are all very good. Um, books right now that Sam really likes is something called the Maximum Ride series, um, which is about these sort of mutant kids that have sort of spy-like adventures. It's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit older, a little bit more exciting, a little bit more intrigue, but it's still, it seems age appropriate. And again, it's sort of like, I think the problem with the 11, 12, and even 13-year-old kid is that they really can deal with stuff that's a little bit more mature than their age than, say, even the 10-year-old. And yet, and so you want to sort of give them that experience, but you don't want to push it too far. I, th I think it's just very, that age is a very fine line. And I have to tell you, you know, I dread thinking about um, access to internet pornography at that age. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, again, that I, I think that there isn't you know, going to have to be a place for that in his adolescent development in a way that I may never even know about. Um, but I remember my dad used to be an amateur photographer, and he used to get these foreign, um, these French film magazines, you know. And in the back were always ads for, red, for these blue movies. And there was <laughs> one magazine that had a it must have been a postage size stamp advertisement, and it had a picture of a woman that probably was naked, but yeah. I just couldn't tell because it was so small. <laughs> and I used to spend hours with a magnifying glass, you know, looking at this picture, trying to discern some sense of nudity from it. And when you think about that was, you know, 19, you know, 78, right? So now mm -hmm. you think about what is accessible now. So part of this, part of the uh, uh, video games and content is also talking about, you know, appropriate uses of the internet and and um, do we go the parental filter route? Do you know sort of really trying to figure out, or is it better to sort of have a conversation and try to continually have open and honest conversations about what we think is appropriate? Um, and yet, again, to kind of trust our kids to have some exploration of maybe even some of the more, you know, icky parts of, of content in the web. We've had this um, conversation in my house where even the boys are nowhere near where I would like them to, you know, be exploring this, the senior side, saying, like, it's not that there's anything wrong with pornography or the human body or, you know, there's all those things, like, we don't have any prohibitions or things like that, but, like, there are things that you need context to see. 
at your age, if you see certain kinds of images without the context and the even like we're like even your brains have to develop enough to be able to incorporate, understand it until you reach that point. If you see them, it may actually distort how you develop, like the way you think about people or bodies or relationships or physical interactions. So we want it's not that we want to keep things from you or that there are images. There are some images that are bad, that are clearly bad, and they go beyond the social norms, but it's even socially normative images for adults. We say these are things that when you're, and they're not seeking them out yet, we can we really actually strictly control their access, but we're like, it's not that it's not that there's a ton of bad stuff out there, there's just stuff that when you're developmentally, developmentally ready for it, then it's okay, but now we don't want it to shape how you think. We want you to explore and understand things through your own self, and then at a point you'll be ready for it, then we're not going to be you know, waggling our puritanical figure, finger at you. That's yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah, I, I think that's really smart. And, uh, you know, we, we have, having two daughters, I don't think mm -hmm. that uh, we deal with the same kinds of things that parents of boys do as much, but we tried filtering, software filtering solutions for our kids when they were younger, but they just, it's so, it's like my kids are always saying, oh, dad, I can't get onto this website, you know, they can't get on... They 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 don't work. It's either you know. I, I tell my wife if we want filters, the filter is to just <laughs> remove computers from the house. <laughs> I, right. I want something that just tells me. Just give me a, a log of everything my kids do, and I'll just tell them I got a log of it. I'm not going to stop you, but I know what you're doing. <laughs> so so just you know, I might check up, but then they can do it. <laughs> That's, That's very good. good. So um. Uh, Glenn, uh, I, I wanted to. I, I'm going to move, jump around a little bit in our, in our show notes here. Yeah. I wanted uh, you to talk about The Hobbit a little bit because you had some interesting things to say. I haven't seen it yet, oh, yeah. but uh, it, it uh, the, the technology has been uh, one of the most talked about things of this movie. I know, isn't that funny? Is like you want it to be the story, and I, you know, there's a lot of dwarves hanging off cliffs in this story. Like that's all I'll say. <laughs> Lots of dwarfing, but it's great. You're not gonna not see it. That's all I can say. Like even if everyone had told me it was horrible, I would be still opening up to see right. it. But I had a friend who wanted it to see it in 3D, and I'm like, all right, I'll see it in 3D because I figured I watched Peter Jackson uh, release this video months and months ago, showing how they conceptualized. 3D, and they're using um, those red cameras that are, you know, the super high resolution cameras, all digital, incredible, and they have like 28 of them for every shot because they have them in stereoscopic sets, they have to have backups, they have to do coverage, and he showed, he said, here is how you conceive of, and in 10 minutes, he explained how you shoot in 3D. And I was like, okay, now I know a thousand times more than I did. And you watch the movie, and they do make good use of 3D. So it's like, um, I've seen Avatar, Hugo, this and, uh, and the movie Pena about the uh, choreographer that uh, Vin Vendor's film. Mm. So I've only seen, I think, the best things ever done in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> or best film, just about. And, he, and so the 3D side, I have no problem with. I think they did a beautiful job using that medium and not particularly overusing it. But this 48 frames per second thing, I hardly heard about it before it was announced. And with these new cameras, they can record and, you know, and then project with these new projection systems at twice the typical frame rate. And I'd heard before I went in, I'm like, they're like, it's going to take a little getting used to. Like, it's a little different. And um, I found it really sort of appalling. I think mm -hmm. filmmakers are going to have to relearn how to shoot because I'm sure it's going to become standard like so many innovations. And the problem with it is everything becomes hyper real. When it's well lit, um, it, it overcomes some of the dimness problems with 3D because it, I'm not sure exactly why. I think there's more light being flashed at you that the dimmest scenes in the movie become brighter and you can actually see detail. But in the bright lit scenes, I'm watching Martin Freeman playing Bilbo Baggins. I can see his makeup. I can see every pore. It looks like I'm watching a guy in a stage set. It was all so real I couldn't step back from it. Like someone was saying it looks like Australian daytime soap arms. I'm like, I haven't seen today. <laughs> yeah, it just it just doesn't everything that's so all the craft that goes into making uh, fake things like Gandalf's staff or something look real, they look fake because uh -huh. you can see them. So in bright daylight and like the very well lit that scenes at the beginning, uh, there's something unsettling about it. You get a little uncanny valley video effect. Then when you go to the dimmer scenes, you can see everything more clearly. But to me, they have the feeling of more of a video game. The clarity and the kind of motion looks more like high-speed uh, uh, LCD display interaction. And a lot of it's CGI also in the caves and so forth, these mines scenes. So I, I don't know what I think about it because I think directors and cinematographers are going to have to relearn part of their craft to make the artifice work again and give us that separation and make things 
look real in a way we take it as a story as opposed to real in real life. Yeah, you know, um, this is similar to what you were, uh, uh, Kevin Kelly uh, saw it and, and said something similar. He, mm -hmm. um, he went to, uh, he was at a party with some, there were some Pixar people there and he, he talked to John Knoll, who's the co-creator of Photoshop. Oh, yeah. And he was a, he's a visual effects director for tons of Hollywood movies and stuff. And so here's what he told Kevin, and, and Kevin put it in his, his own words. Imagine you had the lucky privilege to be invited by Peter Jackson onto the set of The Hobbit. You were standing right off to the side when they, while they filmed Bilbo Baggins in his cute Hobbit home. Standing there on the set, you would notice the incredibly harsh lighting pouring down on Bilbo's figure. It would be obviously fake, and you would see the makeup on Bilbo's in the harsh light. The, text, yeah. the textbook reason filmmakers add makeup to actors and then light them brightly is that film is not as sensitive as the human eye. So these aids compensated for the film's deficiencies of being insensitive to low light and needing the extra contrast provided by makeup. These fakeries were added to, quote, correct film so it seemed more like what we saw. But now that 48 high frame rate and high definition video mimic our eyes better, it's like we're standing on the set and we suddenly notice the artifice of the previously needed aids. When we view the video in standard format, the lighting correctly compensates. But when we see it in high frame rate, we see the artifice of the lighting as if we were standing there on the set. That is abs I, you know, there's no way I could put it that well because that is absolutely how it felt to me, and which just says, if that's remember when 3D first came out and it was heavily misused, the new generation. I, mean, I think James Cameron did it right because he spent so much time and effort thinking about it, and so many movies came out that were just bizarre, and you had Spears being, you know, the old style, <laughs> which being <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, the people get used to it. I, you know, there's a related thing I was thinking about, too, is is this issue of um, the digital conversion, too, is soon all theaters, well, all theaters are now, in, in most of the developed world, now do digital projection. They do, I think it's 4K, right? It's all 4,000 lines projection and so everything's being shot now for that and produced for that and then eventually that'll come into the home and we'll have 4k they're showing at CES this week they're showing uh, I think Sony had an early uh, crash during the demo sadly that had a 4,000 line TV set you know the next generation of super high def and it may be many years before that comes to the home but it's all moving towards that and I think 48 frames per second and some was even saying 60 will eventually come you know for sports and things so we have to get used to it. It'll be the new world. But uh, I was thinking atavistically about the whole issue of the conversion is, is it happened really fast. You know, we've been talking about digital projection happening for years, and then suddenly deadlines were put into place. The studios said, we're going digital, and the theaters had to pony up and put all the money out, and they're trying to recoup that by charging higher prices for 3D. And I was at the theater the other day, and they had this these seats set up, and it was like some another new kind of like motion-moving thing I don't know if this is typical in L.A., and it was you pay even more money and you could watch the next Twilight film with the seats moving with the film or something. Like, so they're always trying to find the next thing they can charge another five bucks for. But wow. the staff that I saw that was fascinating, I was working on a story about the death of sort of uh, analog film. Kodak used to make uh, the peak it, it made in its time just by itself was 12 million film feet a year for the movie industry for shooting and projection. It's now down to, oh, sorry, billion, 12 billion film feet. It's like two, two point something million miles a year. Whoa. Now it's down to about four to five, like in 2012. When the conversion's over, it's going to be at zero. And Fuji is out of the film business for movies. And almost, there'll be a very small industry left because everything's turned to this, you know, direct to digital projection system. But then last year, you also had the master. Right, which was 70 millimeter mm -hmm. and was absolutely beautiful. I don't know if either of you saw that. No, I didn't, the I didn't Paul see that. Tom, I the Paul Thomas like... Anderson, mm -hmm. really beautiful and definitely worth seeing in a movie theater that does not use digital uh, projections. You can yeah, it's see like an art the, thing, right? It's like there'll be yeah. specialty art cinema style stuff and, and you'll need it to be 70 millimeter or something spectacular to make it worth making those prints and then distributing the prints. Right. Wow. So, um, P Peter, uh, you wanted to talk about a TV show that I have not seen, Justified. You said it's back and continues to be one of the great network shows. Yeah. I, so I want to say all my content picks, by the way, are not for 10 and 11-year-old boys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Justified, you know, is, is sort of this typically violent um, television show. 
Um, it's very, very good. The characters are terrific. It's sort of the anti-hero uh, federal marshal um, in Kentucky. And it, there's a, what I like about the show is that it's very much about its place. It's, very much, it's not just about the characters. It's definitely about uh, the location. And so there's a lot of um, sort of the family interactions, the sort of small town, the way people know each other, and how um, even sort of the, cr the crime is often about the way people know each other and, and are continually vying to one-up each other, not only because they're trying to make money, but maybe because of old family feuds and things like that. And here comes this federal marshal who had grown up in this town and tried to leave and eventually get sent back and has to sort of negotiate, again, not only the sort of criminal underworld, but also his relationship with a lot of these people who he grew up with. And um, it's, it's, it's really terrific. That's, uh, that actor there, I forgot his name, that just flashed is, is really wonderful. Definitely worth, definitely worth watching. This is the fourth season now. So w was it off the air for a couple of years, or, or has it been the, the last... Uh... Four I years think in a row. If four years in a row, but you know, with the new model, it's not where you get the great fall season and then the summer's off and then September, the first day of school, the new shows and everything has these weird schedules now, especially. And so um, sometimes it could be. I, so I think the last time it was on was maybe at least a full year ago. Okay. Uh, and is, El, is Elmore Leonard the creator of the show? Yes, or? that's right. And I think he Me. actually even writes some of the episodes. So the dialogue is really smart um, and has that rhythm of his writing. You can really get a sense of that from the show. So That sounds fantastic. And Elmore Leonard is, is uh, tons. I get Shorty is like probably one of his best known uh, screenplays. That's right. From 1995. That sounds terrific. So that's uh, justified, and it's on FX Network. That's right. Okay. Uh, Tuesday nights, and I think it it probably is available on some of the um, on demand, like possibly Hulu. I'm not sure. I know Hulu does have FX, so it might be available there. Okay. Cool. So let's talk a little about some gadgets and and gear. Glenn, you are waiting the delivery of of something. Very special. <laughs> it's so it's here. It's sitting right here since we're doing partly videos. Oh. In the box and I don't have time to open it because I'm talking. To you. I got work to do. But yeah, I've been. I, I've um, I loved my Canon AE one decades ago. It was my favorite camera. I had a bunch of lenses for it. I used to shoot analog, and it was just it was so much fun to use. And I've never quite recaptured it. And it's partly like a dollar cost. You know, I I've never had a need to get higher end gear. Uh, you know, I've got kids. It's hard to come up with the money. It's the motivation, and I so I finally now, <laughs> finally now, uh, have come across because I was waiting for the point at which something comparable to a an SLR, you know, not necessarily a full DLSR, would be compact enough to. Uh, well, here I can. Well, I'm, I'll do the. I'll do the slight unpacking where compact enough to use and high quality enough where you'd feel like you weren't missing the DLSR for most purposes. So these new mirrorless cameras are terrific. So unlike a DLSR. Where it has to flip a mirror back and forth uh, nice. to you know go between the viewfinder and the lens, which is a characteristic of you know the quality and being able to frame it perfect, everything else. The mirrorless ones are using uh, electronic viewfinders that are super high quality. And let's see here, I'll pull the thing out. We'll do a pseudo unboxing. So this is there's a, there's a few great ones on the market. The one that was recommended to me was the Sony. Uh, this one here, it's you can, I don't know if you can see how big it is. It's not. It's tiny. In my hand, and this is the oh, Sony. Wow. It's the um, uh, what's the model number? It's a Stash Seven. It's the NEX Six, and the NEX Seven is a full DLSR. This is just—it's mm -hmm. not much bigger than a old-style snapshot. It's bigger than the current ones. You know, the current ones would probably be, you know, they'd be a bit smaller on one side, have less of the lens. But this is a fifteen. 50 lens and um, it's it's fits in you know fits in your hand. That's the whole point. And I can carry and use this and get the kinds of photography that you used to need. Maybe six or seven years ago, you need a five to seven thousand dollar camera, and it would be much bigger. And then two years ago, maybe be a two or three thousand dollar camera, be somewhat smaller. This is a thousand bucks with the power lens, the 1550 power lens, which is like a 25 75 millimeter uh, 
to pull over 35 millimeter. And anyway, so I'm looking forward to getting it out and shooting after after years of using. Like I have a Canon G11, which is a great snapshotter one. Mm-hmm. It was like a $500 camera. This is my big step up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have some fun shooting with it. How much does it run? It's a thousand bucks even, and you know you get a second battery and whatever. But you that's with the lens. The body itself I think is 800 or 850, and there are different lenses. It also it works with they've got inter uh, intercompatible systems, so you can use other Sony uh, uh, the NAX lens series and other kinds of lenses too. So I, I think it's interesting uh, what you said in the show notes. It's like the choice is either use your your smartphone or get a really great camera like yeah. this. Why? I mean, why? If you have an iPhone five, if, unless you need the zoom, um, it's and, and you know there's better cameras on Android phones than that Apple has chosen. Apple chose a pretty high quality standard base, you know, across all of its systems now, and Android, there's so much diversity. At CES, again, there's an Android camera out. I think Panasonic is almost a proof of concept, and we've seen Android phones that are also sort of cameras. You can put a lens on them, and we're going to see more weird stuff like that, I think, too. If you have a Bluetooth headset, and you got a camera back, maybe you don't need the phone suddenly, but but I think <laughs> even, just, even just the tiny lenses that you can get in, like, an iPhone 5, that takes better pictures than anything I owned as a snapshot digital camera until maybe three years ago, except for the zoom part. And the zoom is coming, and they're Android phones with zooms. It, it is really remarkable that that little tiny lens on an iPhone can do a, a decent job. I would think that it's not getting that much light in there, but... It's incredible. I was just talking a few days ago to John McHugh, who's a war photographer. He's been, you know, he's, he's got his credentials. He was shot in the chest and, and came through uh, five years ago. He's just come out with a neat watermarking app for um, iOS called Markstar, and I was talking to him about that. But he was telling me there's this, like, he knows that people, he likes, like, amateurs to stay in the iPhone. As a professional, he loves it. He goes out with, sometimes with large format, um, you know, for a, a two by um Oh, what size is that? I can't remember the two by three and the bigger format gear and shoots actual film. He goes out with his digital SLRs and he goes out with the iPhone. He said he had to sneak across the border a couple times during the Arab Spring and he had a phone. And I think in that case, like a Nokia, but he'll take his iPhone and no one thinks twice about it. And then he goes out and he shoots. And the cell network stayed up. And a lot of these places where there was unrest, they didn't dare turn the mobile data networks off. So he'd shoot and upload from the field with this amazing device where the quality for his purposes was more than enough for photojournalism and it even pulled out preferentially in many circumstances to use. That's amazing. Wow. So uh, my gadget that I wanted to talk about is the PrinterBot Junior, which is a a really inexpensive 3D printer. Let me see if I can bring it up here on, uh, on the screen share. This is, uh, this is uh, a screen grab from Make Magazine Special Issue wow. the Guide to 3D Printing. It's a really good issue if you are interested in getting a 3D printer. So the, the reason I got the printer bought Junior, it was, it was a, a co-Christmas gift to myself and my, my daughter. Um, it, two, two things running for it, or three really. One is that it's really small so that it doesn't take much room on your desk. A lot of these 3D printers are really big, so this one's a nice small size. It's inexpensive. It's like $400 fully assembled, which is a great price compared to a lot of 3D printers that are, are you know, over $2,000. And then the third thing is that it uh, supposedly, according to the reviews, prints out really nice prints of, of 3D objects. So the, the deal with it is that I am having, uh, we've been playing with it, we've been having difficulty making things that that actually work and I don't know if you can see very well but one of the the first things that you make when you do a 3D printer is make a whistle <laughs> and so the, wow. the, first, the first whistle I started making it and I noticed that it was filling the the hollow part it's really hard to see but I'll just say this part inside the whistle was being filled with like a honeycomb grid yeah the software automatically fills those hollow things until, unless you tell it to stop. So I told it not to, and we tried another one, but it closed the holes. Like, there's no way to blow a hole. Oh. There's no way to blow in there. The top part doesn't work. And then when it was finished uh, on the very top layer, the material was starting to sag because there wasn't support. So we're still learning. I'm getting tips from people about, like, using a fan to cool it down as it's... Um, the the short story is it's really a lot of fun to like mess around with things that you download from Thingiverse 
and then print them out on the printer. So we're just looking forward more and more to doing things with it and we keep on thinking of different things that we can make with it that we uh, need around the house or projects that we're working on like uh, we're working on some little spin bot uh, vibra vibrating uh, devices that draw abstract patterns on paper and so you can make like pen clips for them and stuff it's great for ma quickly making little gadgets and I love the fact that you can quickly iterate and make things with it and if you make like you can make some jewelry with it and if you really like it you print it out and try it and say okay great this ring fits I like the way it looks and then you can go to Shapeways or iMaterialize and get it printed out in really nice quality metal so it's a great prototyping tool and for the price it's fantastic I, I, the, the problem right now I think is that the software for 3D printers is really primitive and hard to use and we're like in the early we're like you know personal computers 1975 1976 <laughs> that's where we are so we need to have someone come up with some really great software that makes this a breeze to use and that you have your 3d model and you say okay press the button and that 3d model is going to be printed out uh, a physical instantiation of it that's exactly like your 3d model and when that happens I really do see this taking off and people finding uses for it that we uh, unforeseen uses how long, about, did it, oh, sorry, go ahead. how long did it take to make that whist print out that whistle the whistle I would say about 20 minutes oh. 20 minutes maybe a little bit longer but that, that's about it one thing that the kids have had success with is uh, there's a, a website called Tinkercad which is an excellent web-based 3D modeling system and you can get a free trial account they charge twenty dollars a month for a, a standard account which I think is a lot of money for a, a 3D modeling system that's meant I think you know for kids and beginners that's a lot of that's you know two hundred and forty dollars a year I, I think they should sell it for a hundred dollars and mm -hmm. be done with it but um, they, what they have been they've been making little name plates with their you know their name and little hearts on it and things like that and then you can't go wrong with those those are easy to make it's funny to me how much um, 2d like uh, 2d cutting and 3d printing is like suddenly everywhere my, my wife is working to start a, a clothing business and she realizes that to make the stencils it makes much more sense to do 2d uh, cutting than to do anything by hand at this point like designing and because you can do all the components and masking and so she's not yet at a point where she's going to buy one but there's a place in town that just opened a service bureau sort of place with a ton of gear and a membership model and then my son my older son they have some enrichment programs at his school we pick up the catalog for uh, winter and it says oh there's a engineering class we're gonna be doing 2d and 3d printing and cutting uh, you'll learn how to design and make your own stuff and he's like I'm in I'm like I want to come too so I'll just come <laughs> up early and I'm thinking that a 3d printer may not be too far off in the Fleischmann house Cool. Future. So, so they have 3D service bureaus that will print out. Uh, our, they'll they'll print out like fabric pattern according to a pattern. Oh, you spec well, the pattern and prints out the fabric. I'm thinking about the 2D. You know, that's going to happen someday. That's the scary part. I think it's uh, polyesters and things. I think we're on the verge <laughs> of that not being that far away. I'm thinking about the 2D cutter part. Oh, okay. You get, but you can also the, uh, the this place Maker House it just opened in Seattle. Ten thousand square foot of Maker stuff of every kind of thing. Well, a wood shop and lathes and manual stuff all the way up to the most advanced 3D printer I think that's on the market with 20 simultaneous input sources you know crazy stuff but their their thing is the 2D cutters used to be you could barely cut paper with it and they've gotten thicker and thicker now you can cut metal with it and um, so you can do you know it's the same thing you can design 2D designs and create stencils or other patterns for doing silk screening or for masking and all that where before it would be a tedious hand done process and you can get relatively small 2D cutters uh, uh, now fairly affordably yeah, I have a, uh, I, I got a, a cutter called the Cricut, the Cricut mm. Mini, and it is a paper and, and vinyl cutter, and it, it cuts really great patterns. The problem with it is, and this was a review unit, I didn't buy it, and when I started reviewing it, I realized you can't upload an SVG file or an Adobe Illustrator file, you can't do freeform, it only lets you use the patterns that are supplied. Oh. 
and to get, then you can buy cartridges that you plug in that have other patterns. I mean, come on. That is antithetical to Mark Frauenfelder. <laughs> it really <laughs> is. And so I was like, I, I, I told the Mark, the, the PR guy who sent me the review unit that I, I didn't think I would review it because I just felt that it was too limiting. And he said um, uh, to be patient that something is coming from this company that will allow free form drawing and okay. when that comes out I will be happy to, to <laughs> review that and if I like it that would be something I could buy because one of the things too that you could do then is do your own printed circuit boards by cutting uh, out vinyl boy, and use it that for would be awesome. yeah it's both directions you're, you're going to be able to you're already starting to be able to print certain kinds of limited circuit boards you could print the um, the solderless kind I think now there's some material that's out for that I just saw yeah. a demo of that online I think and I wrote an article about that but it is very close where you will be able to lay down substrate like epoxy like substance metal the whole thing all in one continuous process it sounds like that is right around the corner which will be completely different I mean it'll cost a fortune relative to the current process initially mm -hmm. and then it'll just dive right down as it, as these things keep keep happening yeah it's amazing I mean at that point you are making your own consumer electronics at home it's so cool yeah <laughs> what happens to the mass market well there's certain components that are always going to be expensive to make because of tolerances so you're always going to have to go to other sources for certain kinds of things but the more the tolerances get closer for the kinds of things you want to do then you know the more you'll be able to make those Atom yeah. smashing, you'll have to outsource. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the last frontier. Food paste. Yeah. Right. <laughs> in, in the couple of minutes that we have left, um, yeah. Peter, I, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, a couple of uh, comic books. One is, uh, is Saga by Brian K. Vaughn and artist Fiona Staples. Yes, it just came, the first collection just came out in trade paperback. I think it's the first eight issues or so. Um, it's it's probably I think it's the best thing he's ever done. It's the weirdest comic that you'll ever read right now. I think that's for mainstream audience. It has um, there's sort of these cyborgs that whose heads are televisions. There's these two. Uh, it's sort of a Romeo and Juliet story of these two characters. The one who's sort of a they're a warrior type people with wings, and then these magic users with horns. And their people have been fighting for generations, and they fall in love and have a baby, and now they're on the run from the authorities. And they just encounter the strangest characters and planet landscapes. It's it's really terrific. It's that and um, last year that and the Daredevil by Mark Wade were my two favorite comics. And so it was great to see this finally collected in a trade for people that might want to start getting into it now. Cool. And I like seeing that that baby just has the, the little nubs of, of <laughs> horns <laughs> coming out of his or her. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's yes. pretty excellent. And then the other one you wanted to talk about was uh, a magazine that I looked at some of the uh, cover, cover images for. And it kind of reminds me of the old Creepies and Eeries that I know you were a fan of. Strange Eons. Exactly. I mean, I was so surprised to find this magazine. It really, first of all, that it's print. <laughs> And that it really harkens back to those, you know, to heavy metal and to Epic Illustrated, Creepy and Eerie magazines, all the great graphic magazine, you know, magazine sized comics that allowed, you know, at the time that was the way to get past the Comics Code Authority was to do things in magazine size because then they could just be on the regular newsstand. They didn't go into the comics rack and so you were free to do things and it just gave creators so much more liberty. This has a lot of great content. It's a mix of comics and prose fiction. It's it, I it it looks like it has about eight or nine issues. I had just found out about it, and it's really terrific. If if you sort of are looking for both a a nostalgia kick, but also just some really great contemporary content. That sounds good. And and to round things out. Uh, Glenn, why don't you talk about the Wreck-It Ralph soundtrack? Oh yeah, it's yeah. funny. I like the movie a lot. I saw it once with a. I once saw it once with an older boy who was my age, and once with <laughs> a younger boy, my son <laughs> who's eight, and um, both equally loved it as did I. I, I my son loved it too. Yeah. It's just you don't. I mean, there's stuff that you have to be a little more of an old style gamer to get, but I think they kept that to a minimum. And I love the fact they don't explain a lot of how it works. It just it is what it is. But the soundtrack is a hoot, and my boys uh, both. The five-year-old who hasn't even seen it but has heard stories. He's 
heard tales from his older brother because <laughs> my younger, my both boys are a little sensitive. The younger one, I think the cybugs would actually freak him out too much and have nightmares. So, but his older brother told him the bold, authorized version, the safe verbal version. So they love it, and it's got. I mean, there's some terrific. Um, uh, callback songs on it, but uh, they got the fellows who did Pac-Man Fever wrote a Wreck It Wreck It Ralph song, and it's it's you know not as perfect as Pac-Man Fever, but it's very much in that style. And I'll tell you the the one that's the earworm is is Sugar Rush. That's the game in the game. Oh, it's that's the, great. Yeah, it's, oh, it's yeah. The, that's where they spent a lot of time in this world. That's kind of it's a it's a beautifully conceived, but the song is done by it's uh what who's the group? It's a Japanese it's called AK. AKB48. It says yeah. here. And so it's mostly in Japanese. And the first time I'm listening to it over the credits, I'm standing there with my friend about my age, and I'm like, that is not English. He's like, are you sure we just can't make it out? We're old, and we can't make it. Oh, not. And then they leash into this, you know, S-U-G-A-R, jump into your racing car, sugar rush. And you're like, oh, no, I'll never get this out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a lot of fun, and then they have a they have all the um, incidental music, the kind of instrumental for themes for different characters, and it's it's good to listen to. So I think it gets the first part of it is more um, you know you can it's listenable, and the later part is more mood music from the film, but but very enjoyable and horrible earworms. Oh, that sounds good. So it looks like AKB48 is like some band that's got about <laughs> three hundred <laughs> Japanese <laughs> girls. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, here's here's a Google Google image search oh for AKB48. Oh, wow. So yeah, I think I've, yeah. I've heard they're very popular, but it's sort of perfect because the game is, it's not exactly anime style, but it's got elements of it, and it's it's just like the game. And the game is, I'm surprised they haven't released it yet. I don't think there's a Sugarland arcade game yet, but maybe they'll have to come out with it because it's a very well conceived game. That sounds that sounds good. Well, you guys. Um, we have uh, hit an hour, so I usually like to end it here. But thank you so much, uh, Glenn Fleischman. You've got the magazine and the New Disruptors podcast, both fantastic uh, uh, new experiments in, in media, and, and I'm loving it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Peter Biebergel, the uh, author of the book Too Much to Dream, A Psychedelic American Boyhood, which is out in a new edition, I guess, from Soft Skull Press. Is that correct? It's a new no, edition? No, just or? not a new, but just a, it is st it's still available. Okay. Still <laughs> available. <laughs> and, and then your, your, uh, your website is mystery, mystery theater at, or mysterytheater.blogspot.com. Okay, well, great, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Fun to do the video session here. Yeah, that was really fun. I'm going to just quickly read an outro. That wraps up another episode of Gweek. To listen to past episodes of Gweek, visit gweek.net. That's spelled G-W-E-E-K dot net.